Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Open In For Live. I'm excited to uh, be bringing you to uh, coming to you live with Jonathan Bryce and Amar Papanavan. Now, we had a conversation um, earlier uh, with Bruce Davey and Martin Casado, and uh, we all had an awesome conversation a couple of days ago. We have Bruce from Australia and Martin uh, bring it, uh, coming from California. So all these are some awesome networking experts. Uh, we've got, you know, Amar here with us live on the stream. So as we bring to you this conversation we had a couple of days ago and recorded, the three of us will be alive in the chat. So we'll be there to answer your questions in the text chat as we go. And then after we roll this conversation, we will actually uh, sh uh, be come back on live and answer any other questions that we haven't been able to get to in the chat. So I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as, as we did. These are three great experts in networking, global connectivity, and why it, this topic is so important to the world and open source. So let's go ahead and roll the video. Hey everybody, welcome to Open In For Live, and we're really excited to have uh, Martin, Amar, and Bruce with us. So to get started, let's talk about global connectivity. And I think the first thing we wanna talk about is just why does it really matter? What all is at stake when we talk about global connectivity? And I thought maybe Amar, you might have some, some thoughts to share on that. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, so yeah, I think the, the main motivation behind, you know, how even I got involved with Magma with some of the numbers that you know we discovered while doing some preliminary research on, on internet access, right? So uh, the internet has become a fairly crucial tool for improving livelihood uh, of people, and 68% of people use that to learn new jobs. In fact, there was a Deloitte report in like 2011 or something that if you connect 10 people onto communication, not necessarily internet, one person moves out of moves uh, above the poverty line, right? So this is actually a lot more than just uh, like a luxury, it's sort of become uh, a necessity, right? And then uh, a lot of people use that as, you know, Martin is deeply familiar with, uh, to pursue an education and also, you know, bridge the digital divide. So the biggest uh, data point and, you know, uh, that came across was that of the 3.3 billion people in developing and emerging markets, uh, most of their network performance is going to degrade by the year 2023, right? So it's not even that we're going to continue to offer the same quality of service. It's actually going to degrade um, uh, by the year 2023. So a lot of the work that we're doing, um, you know, in open source as well as in Magma in particular, is targeted towards emerging market and rural uh, access and areas where there's not been traditional investment. And we're trying to, you know, bridge this gap of like sliding connectivity, which is uh, a pretty key challenge and a barrier. So, so we're, some people would actually get lower performance in the future than they're already getting. So it seems like we actually have a lot of work to do to even offset that. I guess. Did Mark freeze on this this uh, global connectivity initiative? We lost you for just a second there, Mark. What was the what was the last thing you, you said? I just said, you know, I was asking uh, Martin what what his thoughts were on on global connectivity. Yeah. So, you know what I, I find interesting is anytime you talk about kind of like connecting the next billion or the the global connectivity problem, I think people immediately view some island or sub-Saharan Africa and like some hut <laughs> and like, you know, what does it mean to take um, connectivity out there? And that's really a problem. Yeah, that's definitely a problem. But it, it turns out that, you know, listen, I'm, I'm sitting in the Bay Area. I probably have to travel 30 miles to get to areas that have no connectivity. And so the problem is so much more pervasive than most people realize. Um, if there's a huge issue in the United States, something like 23 million people in the United States, which is just under 10% are underconnected. Um, so from my standpoint, the internet came very quickly. It changed everybody's lives. It's almost a necessity, but because probably the, how rapid the growth was, uh, it has not been homogenous in that growth. And um, anywhere you look, um, uh, I think that there is, you know, something to do and, you know, having, you know, like Bruce and like Amar been in networking for the last 10, 20 years, I think there's a lot of good that, you know, we can do by focusing on this problem. And you don't have to go to, you know, Amazonia or the Philippines, you know, or Sub-Saharan Africa in order to have an impact. Yeah. J Jonathan, do you have any thoughts on this? 
Yeah, I was going to say that, um, you know, what Martine is talking about there, I think, has, is something that I've definitely um, noticed as well. Uh, my, uh, my, my parents live in, in kind of uh, East Texas, and it's, it's, you know, it's a few hours from here, and I go there and visit, and, and the, the network connections are, are, are always less reliable there. And I, I think the point that you made, which is that we've we've made a lot of progress, but it hasn't it hasn't been um, kind of even progress that has that that everyone has advanced at the same rate. One of the things that talking about my parents that whenever I'm thinking about connectivity and the value of it, uh, we travel a lot for work when in non-pandemic times, and uh, and you know my dad when I when I travel a lot of times he's like, okay, well where are you staying? You know what hotel are you going to be in? How do we reach you? And 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 uh, for me, you know, I'm just like you have my mobile number. You know, that's how you reach me <laughs> where I am. But um, you know, that's not that's not the way it is for for everybody. It's a huge. It's been a huge ad advantage, I think, for uh, for those of us who do have that kind of always on connection to the network. Always have all of all of the people that we want to talk to at our fingertips and the data that we want. But that development of of that advancement, I think, has has definitely been uneven. Um, Everywhere in the world, and, and yeah, in many uh, in many places that that you maybe don't uh, don't think of as as the first ones that pop into your head. Yeah, thanks for the story storytelling. If anyone else has any stories about about their traveling and connecting with their parents, uh, let me know. I think uh, you know it definitely affects people everywhere, and yeah, East Texas is is not the most wired uh, part of the of the country. That's for sure. So I think, you know, one of the things we wanted to talk about next is just kind of what are some of the big forces that are driving change across the industry more, you know, uh, globally in terms of the trends and, and what's happening in the technology side. And um, yeah. so I think, you know, Jonathan, do you want to take yeah. us through that? So I, um, you know, I was talking with Amar last week, actually, and and he uh, he made a comment that the, uh, network evolutions have uh, have always been in service of new computing platforms, and uh, and and that was uh, an, an interesting uh, thing that uh, that he mentioned. And so I asked him uh, to tell me more about that, and he said, "Actually, you should talk to Bruce Davy about that." <laughs> <laughs> so Bruce, I mean, what, is, is that something that you agree with? Do you think that that's that is often what drives those those major sea changes at the network level is actually computing, or what are the things that kind of drive those changes? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a good point that. You know, basically, we've we've you know, we've seen a, a network that evolved from connecting all the compute facilities in in the world back in the, like the seventies. Like that was the internet, right? It was built to connect essentially a few dozen computers that a very privileged few people had access to. And you know, one of the biggest shifts in networking was the when we suddenly started seeing smartphones. All of a sudden, there were you know, there's a computer in everybody's pocket, and so we've gone from an architecture that was meant to connect a few dozen computers to an architecture that now needs to connect billions of computers. And in some respects, the internet's done an amazingly good job of managing that transition. Um, you know, there was kind of one big glitch, which was that the original internet addressing space wasn't quite big enough for several billion devices, but that one's been pretty well addressed. But the, the other thing is this idea that, you know, the place where you connect to the network now could be anywhere on the planet, as opposed to it being inside a lab that's kind of the really big change. And so we've we've got an architecture that works pretty well for connecting fixed devices in you know big buildings, but we the architecture for connecting all these mobile devices that are spread all over the face of the earth, that's still a little bit in in you know evolution. And I think one really interesting thing that's happened is so we had the internet architecture worked really well, and then we've had this parallel architecture of connecting mobile devices. And they've kind of grown up in two different ways. And now what we're seeing is they're starting to converge. And to some extent, this is what I think Magma is doing, is it's taking all the things that were proven to work really well in the internet and applying those principles to mobile networks in a way that hasn't been done before. So you know, if you look at the architecture of today's mobile networks, it's actually not that hard to see. They started off being voice networks. And then data services were kind of grafted onto them over time. Um, and so I think what we're seeing with Magma is trying to take sort of an internet centric view of the world and apply that out to the edge. And, and that's really what we need to do if we're going to connect billions of devices all over the world. 
Yeah, I, um, I, I think we have a stat that came from a, a recent analyst report that's the 2030. Um, and, and I remember a few years back when, uh, when we first started talking about this internet of things kind of uh, um, uh, move and, and some of this, the people were talking about 10 billion and 20 billion devices and that kind of thing. Uh, in this time frame, and now you know, we're up to 50. And first of all, I, you know, I'm always these numbers are, I think, always uh, just big guesses. But it does seem like every time that they've revised these guesses, they're getting higher. Do you think these numbers are realistic, or do you think the they're too high, too low? What, what do you think we're really going to see as we, we head through the next decade? Oh, this is. T I mean, 50 billion seems totally believable. I mean, how many devices are in your house right now? Right? And so, I mean, granted, we're we're at the kind of the rich end of the spectrum. You know, I think, but the you know the idea that there's more than one device per person that to me seems completely obvious, and you know, it's it's just a matter of like how many devices per person. So you know, to me, fifty billion actually doesn't seem that ambitious. I mean, I'd be surprised if it isn't that now. Honestly, if you think yeah. about, I'm I'm just saying. I mean, like it depends on I think maybe what you mean on the internet. But if you're just talking about like endpoints connected to a network that have public connectivity, I'm certain it's more than than fifty billion. Yeah, and yeah. and then you, yeah, you, and then you start thinking about you know wh when we start using devices to you know think about autonomous vehicles like that feels like something that's maybe within ten years, um, and you know I think the, a lot of what's been talked about with five G is just being faster, which I, th I think is kind of actually not that interesting, and you know a good four G service works pretty well as long as you don't have to share it with too many other people. But the the thing which I think is much more exciting is when you start trying to do connectivity to a vast number of devices and to do it in a way that is cost effective and to do it in a way that deals with you know having low latency there's a bunch of things you have to deal with as the number of devices gets bigger and, and that's why i think this is sort of most people when they think about the evolution of mobile networks we go 3g 4g 5g we're always thinking about going a bit faster but i think there's much more interesting transformations happening that have a lot more to do with this increasing amount of activity at the edge. And I mean, the autonomous vehicles is one that I often use as an example because it's pretty obvious how quickly you need to be able to get information to devices if you're gonna try to communicate with them in the time frame necessarily necessary to handle things like autonomous driving. You need like a lot more compute, obviously, at the edge too, right? It's, it's exactly. the network's speed increases driving the need for more compute and vice versa. And, and obviously like intelligence, and sort of the ML AI side of it seems like it, it, it just changes everything when you have that super low latency, more exactly. so, like you said, than the raw speeds, which get the headline, but it's actually not what's disrupting the, the architectures, that's right? right? And, and that's why I think uh, when, like, when you look at the architecture of Magma or even the architecture of, of sort of a more standard 5G implementation, you're going to see more like a cloud computing system out of the edge. You know, so we're used to the idea of the, you know, there's big you know, data centers that sit in a handful of locations and you, you know, traverse a long distance to get to your nearest Amazon or Azure data center, but they were into these little mini data centers out of the edge so that you can do that local edge computing. So what yeah. are some of the specific things that are different architecturally about Magma that, that make it a better fit for that? What are some of those, those changes that, that tend to support that kind of more uh, more parallel distributed device type traffic versus um, something that's more central back and forth uh, to, to fewer devices. I mean, for me, the, the, the single biggest innovation in Magma is that the details of the radio don't leak into your in, into your core. Um, you know, so if, if you look at a traditional implementation of a cellular network, you can tell by looking at its core what kind of radio there is. And that, to me, it's analogous to like, imagine if you could go into the core of the internet, look at a great big router sitting inside, inside an ISP and tell which users were on Ethernet and which users were on Wi-Fi. And like to the idea that that sort of access technology and the state of, of individual edge devices leaks into the core, I think is one of the big shortcomings of the standard sort of telco cellular architecture. And when you look at Magma, it basically terminates all the wireless protocols right at the edge so you can then build a core that's independent of what's going on. And that has all kinds of implications, um, but it basically means you can build a more scalable, more reliable 
kind of core. And also you can say, oh, if I can get access to any kind of radio, I can, I can stick it onto my magma core. So I don't have one core for 3G and a different one for 4G and a different one for Wi-Fi and one common edge system that terminates all the radios right at the edge and then provides common core services to those, uh, to those radio devices. I, I, listen, I also think it's worth pointing out, so I just to jump in here, which is Magma itself is remarkable, and we're going to talk a lot about Magma, which is great. But I think actually Magma is also an indicator of something bigger, right? It's like almost like technologies come and fill in needs. And you can look at this technology or you can look at the need, right? And it says something about the ecosystem. It says something about the need. And so I, I think that it's just kind of a good point to point that out, which is... Um, it's turned out connectivity has come to the point where it allows for something like Magma. What does that mean? It means it's an open source project that can run on other people's hardware where you can have um, hobbyists, companies work on it, which means that there's enough maturity in the supply line, there's enough maturity in the developers, and there's enough need from the customer base for this type of thing. And that didn't exist 10 years ago. So it almost feels like as an industry, um, as a community, um, we're now ready for an open platform to solve connectivity problems writ large. And so I love that we're talking about Magma because itself, it, it really fits that need very well. But again, yeah. it, the reason it exists and is viable is just because I think the world is now ready for such a thing. Well, that, that you bring up a really good point there. And, and it's one of the things that I wanted to, wanted to get to, which was to talk about some of those new, um, cause I think besides the, the, the computing platform, I think there are commercial forces that are also driving this change uh, on the network. Um, and, and you know, one thing that there was a, um, a light reading article that, that came out just a few days back that had had some stats about the wireless internet service provider or the, the wireless ISP market. This is a market that I didn't really even know existed as a as kind of like a whole thing until maybe about a year ago. Um, but this uh, the, this article covered some stats from a recent report. It said, for instance, that the, um, the number of customers that, that the, uh, the wireless ISPs have, it, it's currently doubling every five years. And the, uh, the, it's basically, you know, 73%, uh, I think, is the, uh, the annual growth rate there. Um, and this is uh, the thing that, that really surprised me is that last year, I think it was already over a $4 billion market in the US in, in terms of the revenue for, for this category that um, is is actually one of the I think one of the main things that um, that that becomes a use case for Magma. You know, like you said, the part of the reason why Magma as an open source project can exist is because there is now this this commercial opportunity and there's a need. And these uh, these wireless ISPs are 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 interesting to me because they are filling some of those those spaces in uh, in in the United States, for instance, that haven't had great coverage. And they're also going after um, markets that haven't always been appealing to the traditional network operators. So I think you're, you know, you, you raise a really good point there. Um, what do you think are some of the other the other opportunities uh, that that this new um, this new style of network is, is either going to enable or that that it's going to have to meet the demands of um, new uh, kind of new use cases? So I'm going to say something quickly, and I think uh, actually Amaro's got a great perspective on this. But so I, I think there's this grand convergence, right? It's like you know whatever, like the samurai movie, or like you know like the like the, like from the different regions they come together and they form like this kind of great group, and like in, in in the metaphorical sense. So listen, the hardware supply chain is now ready, right? It's to the point that we can use it. Um, I think regulatory policy has evolved so much that we actually now have a lots of access to spectrum. Um, the software has gotten there, um, and then the understanding of the use cases. All of these things have gotten together now, so that um, we can we can deploy more cheaply than ever cellular uh, connectivity in, in in more varied areas ever than before. And so, I think that you know one way to think about this is we can address you know known problems, which is you know there's the there's the well known problem of connectivity. You know we. we we know that people are underconnected, and and we can solve that problem. And that's a huge, that's a massive, massive market. I mean, we're talking tens of billions, probably hundreds of billions. Actually, if you look at just the geosynchronous satellite market alone, 
which you could definitely do with terrestrial uh, bandwidth better. It's a two hundred billion dollar market. So we're talking about like markets that consume other markets, you know, for breakfast type thing. Trillions. So, I like trillions. I mean, well, well, easily. And we're talking about connectivity, right? You know, and like even just basically, you just like 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 an old crufty part of this like geosynchronous satellites, and it's huge, right? And so, and so, I think there's just going to be a lot of like kind of business innovations pushing that into new areas. But then you can ask the question which you're asking now, which is, well, well, so what does that unlock, right? You know, you you're almost in this economic equilibrium where you can't push this into like every device or every new corner, but now you can. What does that open up? I'm certainly not in the position to predict that, but I'm so excited to see the Cambrian explosion of these new apps kind of open up because now we have the enabling technology to do that. Yeah, Amar, what do you think? What are what are some of the use cases that you have seen coming from Magma um, users that are that are uh, are are the the leading edge of the Cambrian explosion? Yeah, I think uh, yeah. So definitely, like the the CBRS market has opened up a bunch of uh, players, and you know. Spectrum. Can I can I stop you there for just a second? And yep. can you, um, for people who aren't familiar, you know, this is another new acronym that I had to learn recently. Could you uh, just give a, a quick uh, definition of CBRS? Uh, so CBRS is uh, community broadband, I think, radio spectrum, I believe, uh, but it's basically owned by uh, the U.S. Navy. Uh, and uh, and uh, in the non-coastal areas, that is uh, currently available for gender use by other people using this uh, a spectrum database that gives you a la uh, like a lease. So think of this as DHCP, but for spectrum, right? So right, this sir. allows a lot yeah. of people to um, you know get access to licensed spectrum. So what yeah, this is sort of is the thing that happens with these multi-billion-dollar auctions every so often where the, the giant companies go gobble it all up and nobody else can access it. CBRS gives a, a, a dynamic way where I can, I can actually get a lease on, on a little bit of spectrum around my location here and then make use of it. And, and, uh, and that's something that is, um, that is completely new, right? In, in the history of, of sort of radio spectrum, at least in the U.S., I know that that there are policies around this in other countries too. But at least in the U.S., it's totally new, right? That's right. That's right. Exactly. Uh, thanks for the help there. Yeah. So I think what what it actually did is that by unlocking the spectrum barrier, it sort of it it opens up one axis for innovation. And just echoing Martin's point, right? Like the the thing with the even the previous generation of ne like networking, like SDN, right? A lot of the work that Martin and Bruce did was that it never actually optimized for a particular application. What it did was it built a platform that was suitable for heterogeneity, right? So that is basically what the networking platform that's going to service connectivity is going to be, is, is that it's not going to be a platform that's going to be in a position to predict the next killer use case. It's going to be a platform that can abstract away that heterogeneity so the killer use case gets enabled, right? And that is where I think the, the key investment that is going to happen is going to be. And there's obviously uh, like, you know, uh, at the end of the day, people need to bring home the bacon. So there are obviously like, you know, uh, you know, connecting people and, you know, paying for like priority and those kind of uh, use cases are like sort of the tip of the iceberg. But there's a completely new sort of uh, like, you know, market that's getting created with wearables, right? Like wearables are all like, you know, tethered devices and they have a fundamental problem where, you know, they're thermally bound. So you can't keep sticking CPU in there, right? So it, you can't do all the computation that your, like your, like your smart glasses need or your watch needs at the edge, right? So at that point, you need to figure out how do I create a consistent runtime between the edge and the network? And all of these things are like, you know, patterns that in some way rely on like a wireless network being in there that's sort of facilitating this. And what we think here is going to happen is that the open platform that Martin spoke about that is best suited for heterogeneity is going to be in the best position to sort of unlock the next like billion dollar use case, right? And maybe like to Bruce's point, like the, the Uber app, right? All it required was GPS and, and like LTE, and then you suddenly got Uber on your phone and then it like completely changed uh, the, the taxi industry. Mm -hmm. Are there other change? I uh, change automotive, <laughs> like <laughs> not just yeah. the taxi industry. <laughs> yeah. Are there other policy examples like the like the Spectrum example that that um, besides the technology, besides the software, the hardware, and and kind of like the 
the business desire? Are there other policy issues that are that are kind of um, you know keeping the the old network models entrenched or or you know harder to change? Yeah. So at least in in a lot of emerging markets, um, uh, a, a huge percentage of GDP is actually based on tax that the MNOs pay. Right. Like it's it's basically like there's there's a large unbanked sector, and then there's these like people buying data plans, and then that drives a lot of tax revenue. So historically, there have been like uh, you know that that has sort of been something that you know. Uh, Regulation is like you know the telecom industry has been like heavily regulated because of that, right? So so licensing of like you know for an ISP in many of these emerging markets is actually pretty difficult because you know they don't want to like cannibalize a pretty large revenue stream. Right? A, a lot of these, uh, especially in LATAM, what we're seeing is that a lot of these governments are actually seeing connectivity more as a fundamental need. And so are sort of adapting the regulations to sort of make this a second uh, uh, a second order need as opposed to a primary need. And then by just bringing connectivity, they're seeing enough like monetary advantage and you know economic activity that it's sort of you know compensating for some of the GDP uh, related issues that you know ISPs that don't pay as much taxes as a MNO is sort of influencing. But yeah, in, in general, like spectrum is probably the biggest barrier. Uh, because that is the uh, the entry uh, the entry bar there is pretty high. Okay, and uh, you know there are um, private LTE networks. I know are another another area where um, you know people are 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 uh, using basically wireless technologies to replace running cables in plants and facilities and. And again, it seems like as you lower the cost and the complexity and, and improve the capabilities of, of these tools, there's just going to be a lot more of that. The, um, there was a, uh, a, uh, a, some news last week from, from uh, one of our, our, uh, our, the companies that we've known for a while is, or the people that we've known for a while, Boris Rinsky, he, he started a company last year called FreedomFi, um, which is, uh, is, is kind of diving into this, uh, this new world, and uh, and they announced a, um, a a partnership with the Helium Network that uh, that gives you a FreedomFi gateway, which is you know that's what's pictured here with the smiley face on it. Um, mm -hmm. That's running. Uh, it's basically running Magma. It connects to uh, to these kind of standardized uh, um, radios that are now available, and uh, and then is a way to offload traffic. From using the Helium network and uh, and and their uh, their kind of like coin um, payment system that they have, uh, you know, if you look at this headline, it has pretty much all of the buzzwords in it at <laughs> once with cryptocurrency and 5G and mining and you know Freedom Fi and all this kind of stuff. But I think that this is you know this is another example of something that that just probably 18 months ago people wouldn't have really been thinking about, and uh, when um, we were chatting with Boris today, and he said that. Uh, what did he say, Mark, in terms of the response? Yeah, he they said got? they had over ten thousand uh, paid pre-orders for this this box, and and to me, it's just like really interesting because you think about like what what uh, you know Martine and Amar were saying a minute ago about sort of like the tax revenue and governments and like sort of this concentration of power and a small number of providers and 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 in these different you know government systems and spectrum is this kind of like choke point, so to speak. And then you think about decentralization as, as kind of this big wave the other direction. And you have like this crypto thing and this, you know, distributed uh, private 5G or 4G uh, thing that, you know, uh, Freedom5 is doing. So it's, it's interesting to see these kind of forces and counter forces at work. But I'm, I'm curious what Bruce thinks about all this crazy stuff that we're talking about. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it, it is a good example of how if you if you create a platform that doesn't sort of presuppose a particular outcome, then you you open up opportunities for innovations. So, like, like I guess I always like to think about how you know the internet didn't particularly optimize for any one application, and uh, like I can remember before there was a World Wide Web, there were lots of other ways of getting access to information on the internet, but none of them were particularly easy to use. Um, and then, you know, one day the World Wide Web became the easy way that everybody got access to information and we stopped using things like Gopher and the Gopher. other things that existed before <laughs> it. But it was like, 
<laughs> I'm sorry, I'm really old here, but <laughs> um, That's amazing. the uh, you know the the idea that you could um, build a network without having any idea what the what the the dominant application would be, and and certainly when I see something that combines like 5G and cryptocurrency, I'm like, okay, well, there's two things I didn't expect to be combined <laughs> into a single offering, but it's like, well, you know, both of those are just you know building on a platform that doesn't presuppose a particular sort of optimization for for one outcome. Um, even like the way the, the way broadband is provided, um, like I think it's it's very interesting to me that you know when I lived in the US, I had a choice of roughly two broadband providers. Um, whereas now that I live in Australia, connectivity is is kind of done as a regulated monopoly effectively, and then like that you get layer two from the from the the connectivity provider. But then there's dozens and dozens of ISPs that run on top of that. And so they've kind of made connectivity a basic offering and then the ISPs compete on top of that. So there's like a completely different way of slicing the market that has certainly led to more innovation in terms of how ISPs compete than what you see when it was sort of sliced in a different way. So it just does kind of show you how making certain policy choices will have impacts on how the technology rolls out. Yeah, I, I love that. And I think I tell you, when we started OpenStack like a decade ago, we had no idea that telecoms would want to run it at all. And now here we are uh, at this point and we see that like 4 billion people in the world are actually connected to networks powered by OpenStack. It's insane. I mean, we had no idea. It's sort of a general purpose technology, right? Compute storage networking. But the fact that phone calls might be routed through networks powered by OpenStack was the furthest thing from our mind at the beginning. And now like nine out of 10, uh, of the top, you know, providers in the world are actually powered by OpenStack. So I'll get my quick plug in there for OpenStack. But it's, it's just a really good example of, you know, when you design a technology or even just kind of enter a market with some per some different tools that enable people to do things, they're going to do stuff that you just absolutely did not expect. And uh, so it's, it's a great point. I, I want to I wanna just say that <laughs> I have no idea about the Freedom Fi thing that you showed. <laughs> But, you know, and it sounds super buzzwordy, right? Like 5G and like crypto and yada, yada, yada. However, uh, and, and again, I, I didn't even know about this going into this. It actually makes sense, right? Which is routing has always been a distributed thing, right? And connectivity has always been a distributed thing, right? And there's always been this dream that why do we have to have central infrastructure that's run by a telco when, you know, listen, I have real estate, you have real estate, I have a tall, you know, part of my building, you have a tall part of your building. And so if you can create a way to incent people to offer real estate and bandwidth, which has always been a very important thing, and you had a way to monetize that securely, it all of a sudden makes sense. So sure, 5G is just kind of, yes, this is fast. You could imagine some incentive scheme on top of that to promote more bandwidth, more connectivity, more points for us, uh, an mm -hmm. asset that is actually a fixed asset, which is real estate. So again, I don't know if that's even what they're doing. I just think it's so cool that you have a platform now where people can marry these concepts. And what seems to me as you know, and the, the uninitiated in, in a very obvious and cool way. So I think that was super cool. Yeah, I mean, they had that seems like they had a great response, and uh, and and I I can't wait. I mean, Boris is uh, is is always going to make something happen. And <laughs> Boris is the he's best. He's a force yeah, of nature. I, I love we him. love Boris. <laughs> I love Boris. He's awesome. So, um, uh, you know, and this, maybe this is I guess this could be any of y'all, but I what what um you know if we are are thinking about the technology pieces that are um, that are going to drive this. We've got uh, we've got a few of them in open source already. What do you think are the pieces that that we uh, we still need to be working on as as kind of communities overall to open up and to keep to keep enabling more access and more um, innovation in, uh, in in terms of the network? I know we've we've touched on radios a couple of times, and um, there are things like ORAN, and and we've touched on. Um, obviously, Magma with the core, and what what do you think are the, the pieces that that bring it all together that might still be missing? I mean, I, th I I do think one of the things that's often neglected is how do you make it easy to operate these kind of services? You know, that network management's kind of you know always been the the sort of the unfortunate stepchild of of networking, um, and, uh, and I think that's one of the areas where I really like the idea of being able to pick up 
ideas from other parts of the community. And so, you know, if you look at part of what's going on in Magma that I think is potentially very powerful is you don't necessarily build your own um, system for doing logging and alerts. You you leverage something else from the open source community and then you say, well, we can just get a best practice from there and bring it in as opposed to we're going to go and implement something that's, you know, completely optimized for a telco environment. So that to me, like how do you make the operations as easy as possible? The thing is, there's a sort of, thing that I found very frustrating dealing with the telcos over many years, the sense of, oh, we're going to go do everything open source because it's going to drive down our costs without realizing the level of expertise they would need to, to stand up and, and run open source software. And so, you know, I, I, we shouldn't sort of get, get over rotated onto thinking open source is the cure for everything. It only becomes a solution when you can operate it. And to me, that's the thing which we've got to be putting a lot of focus on. Couldn't agree more. It's a, yeah, it's a really, really good point. So yeah. I have a slight, it, it's a great point, Bruce. I couldn't agree more. And I think uh, leveraging a lot of the cloud infra is pretty critical to build the next generation of computing and network. Uh, I think one thing that is sort of holding back uh, the, at least the connectivity space is the complexity of the standards. Um, I think a lot of what uh, has happened with uh, 3GPP is that it's a, it's a one size fits all standard. So regardless of whether you're operating a small fire, fixed wireless site at the end, or like you know, you know, like like what Martin's uh, doing at NeuralNet, or whether you're like running a, like a mobile network in downtown New York, like the specification and the requirements that the are put out to the network are almost the same. And I think just being able to decouple the use case from the specification is actually a pretty big thing that we need to achieve. And showing that it's done in the open is a good way of saying, okay, hey, if you really want to run this fixed wireless network, here's 80% of the standard that you don't need to worry about. And then you know, showing that as a reference implementation and trying to influence the industry to move that uh, forward is, is actually a pretty big thing. And I think we should probably continue to push on that as well. Yeah, that's, a, that's another one that I think um, is, is a uh, that that becomes one of those those barriers to kind of breaking into influencing the direction similar to to spectrum policy and other things like that where it it, it uh, if you want to try to come in and and do something innovative or or real really different than what this what has been happening then then there are some of these roadblocks. I I think I think. What's excited about this is if you zoom out just a little bit, which is there are massive technology trends. There is a market. There are new applications. We've talked about all of them. Um, but I mean, I almost feel like doing a call to arms, which is it's, it's, it's hard to find another sector or another area where the problem domain is this rich. If you actually look at like what Amar is doing um, with Magma, it touches tech, economics, regulation, social issues, operational logistics issues i mean like that like like all of these things are required in order to like do deployments and so you know often tech is like this kind of 2d chess game you know like with tech pieces and then maybe tech and economics is a 3d chess game <laughs> and like whatever i mean i think that this is kind of as kind of complex and interesting as rich the problem spaces i've ever seen in my entire life um and so you know for those that are listening that are interested i i, I do recommend them actually looking into this broad problem of you know, connectivity, what does it mean going forward? What are the convergence, what's happening? What is magma and so forth? Because again, like we're at this like, you know, inflection point um, now, and we're seeing, I think the same type of evolution with, you know, last mile connectivity that we saw in the PC industry, you know, back in the eighties. And so it, it really is quite interesting. Yeah, you, you mentioned social issues. And, and in addition to getting involved in kind of, you know, these technologies and open source communities, I know that, that, uh, that several of you also also work with um, with some organizations uh, that are that are trying to address some of that that uh, disparity and connectivity. Maybe uh, uh, Amara Martin, if you want to want to uh, shout out to some of those organizations that people can look into as well. Sure. Well, I'll I'll start very quickly on this, um, and then Amara, if you want to jump in. So, so uh, I co-founded a. Um, 
uh, an organization. It's a 5013C. It's a nonprofit. It's called Mural Networks. And what we do is we bring cell connectivity um, out to indigenous areas in the United States, right? And so uh, in rural areas, less than 70% of tribal land has cell coverage. So that, and, and if you actually look at this, the, the popul from a population standpoint in the, in the more rural areas, less than 70% actually have connectivity. Um, but it's, you know, like, listen, so to, to come and actually to provide solutions in these areas, if you just look at the social aspect, which you brought up before, Jonathan, I mean, it's very complicated, right? I mean, you know, like this is, you know, new technologies that, that impacts people. There's a lot of benefits. You have to be sensitive to their needs. You can't just bring it and walk away, right? And kind of leave them with something that's non-functional. You have to have economic viability. You've got to do capa um, uh, capability building. You've got you know, they've got to be trained or learn to do what they're doing. I mean, you know, this is a very multifarious effort. And so Mural Networks has been doing this for about five years. We've connected a lot of organizations, but there's a lot more to do. Then uh, Amar, you should probably hop in. You've been doing a lot of work in, uh, on- Well, as in MuralNet actually was our first site that went up, right? So <laughs> we've been partnering with us uh, <laughs> since day one. Yeah, so I, I think, yeah, no, I, I, I do agree that, um, you know, the, the like there are a lot of uh, these community uh, centric like sort of um, ISPs out there that are actually you know bringing uh, connectivity into uh, like the underserved areas and a good way to engage with that would be um, you know join the uh, open source movement around a lot of these uh, efforts including magma as well as help and evangelize a lot of what we're trying to do which is you know uh, bring connectivity and you know de try to decentralize some of the connectivity initiatives, uh, especially in in the U.S. as well as in in Latin America. All right. Well, thank you all uh, so much. This has been an awesome series of topics. Obviously, it's very very important that we all get involved in open source and policy and all these different ways, and maybe throw some crypto in there, but. Uh, before we go, I want to just make sure that everybody knows how they can reach all of you. So I'm Sparky Collier on Twitter, but uh, Martine, how can people connect with you if they want to they want to work more with you on this important stuff? I am Martine underscore Casado on Twitter. All right. And Amar, how about you? Uh, I'm reachable on the Magma Core Slack uh, as well as on Twitter. I'm Amar Fad in both. Awesome, and Amar's Amar's our uh, magma expert, so you want to get connected with him and talk a lot more about magma. And, and Bruce, uh, where can people find you to to work with? Yeah, you yeah Twitter's stuff? probably the easy way, or, or LinkedIn. But uh, on Twitter, I'm underscore Dr. Bruce D. Awesome, and then uh, last but not least, Jonathan, uh, how can people find you? I'm I'm uh, Jay Bryce on Twitter, but I'm not on Twitter very much. So uh, <laughs> I'm. I'm so old, I still use email. Jay Bryce at jbryce.com. <laughs> oh, wow. Electronic <laughs> mail. Well, thank you all for coming on Open End for Live. And this has been another awesome episode. So thank you all so much. All right. Well, we are back live. Um, that was such a great conversation. I really enjoyed uh, talking with Bruce and Martin and, of course, Amar. So maybe as we have a few minutes here, we've got some great questions coming from chat. Just to kick it off, uh, looking back at all of the comments and, and what uh, we discussed, uh, maybe we can talk about some of the points that were raised. You know, one of the things Bruce said that I thought was really interesting is that throughout the history of computing, we see these computing paradigm shifts happen and that always changes the network dramatically. We have to re-architect, create all kinds of new technologies. And you know, we talked quite a bit about magma and so Maybe uh, Amar, you can talk a little bit about you know why a mag, what magma is, and kind of how people can get involved in the community as an open source community that's that's very welcoming to contributors and and what it's trying to to accomplish. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, so uh, yeah, magma is a fully open source uh, project. Uh, it's a neutral um, uh, organization that has an open governance. Uh, that you can find at the link uh, below, magmacore.org. Uh, that's a great entry point for, for the conversation. Uh, stepping back a little, uh, Magma, at the end of the day, is trying to build like the universal network backend for this next generation of computing. And so as part of that, it like simplistically, you can think of it as a core that is access agnostic, like uh, it's Wi-Fi, LTE, or 5G capable. But going forward, uh, we're also starting to look at integrated access backhaul for enabling a lot of the satellite use cases. And Brian Barrett, who is uh, 
on the technically uh, technical advisory council of of magma is uh, pretty influential in that space and so we're trying to take a pretty clean slate approach of like okay what is it that the network of the next generation needs uh, some of it is access agnostic some of it is like you know embracing cloud native technologies or like you know borrowing from the internet architectures and then uh, other aspects are you know moving things to the edge so we're trying to do all of these things and so we'd love to uh, get your participation as well as you know ideas and thoughts to sort of help move the program forward again magmacore.org is the best way to get engaged with the project Oh, thank, thanks, Amar. Uh, Jonathan, what, what did you think uh, was was a good thing to follow up on from from the live comments or or the discussion earlier? Um, well, we had a we had a lot of good uh, comments coming into the chat, um, especially from DRUK, uh, and he actually uh, uh, um, I think you know picked up on on one of the things that that Bruce mentioned as well around. Uh, operations being uh, being complex, and he also asked a question, uh, which was, any advice on choosing the right open platform? What stresses me out is technical debt, investing in a technology, getting it embedded, only to see the supporters or vendors ditch the platform. I think that's you know really really good question, definitely something to think about. Um, you know, when whenever you're adopting these core technologies, uh, with you know we. You were talking about OpenStack and and how that's uh, and nine of the ten top uh, major network operators are, are running OpenStack and when they make those kinds of investments, those are decade or multi-decade type um, investments in technology and so you definitely don't want to want to be picking something that is uh, that that's flash in the pan or or going to disappear and I think that that um, the way that I think about it there are are several key elements to consider when you're looking at open technologies. Um, for me, you know, one of the, the the most important is the community around it, making sure that there is, um, you know, multiple uh, contributors from different organizations, that there's diversity in the, the companies and the use cases, uh, because that helps to ensure that, that there's truly a, a long term market for it that where it won't just it won't just disappear. And, you know, to Amar's point, um, Magma started out inside of uh, inside of a Facebook team that launched it and open sourced it. And in the last uh, you know, six months to a year, uh, that team has spent a lot of work moving it into a, a fully open community like that and uh, has garnered um, contribution and involvement from, from a number of different organizations now and expanded use cases and in, into different geographies. So I think you know, community is definitely um, one of the, the top um, elements to look for. And I think another key piece when you were thinking about these these fundamental platforms and uh, and the open technology is uh, is to kind of check out how um, how the development process itself is managed. Um, you know, there are all kinds of ways to to do open source, and uh, and and there are lots of uh, um, you know lots of different approaches to how open source maintainers accept code and test code. Uh, in the Open Infrastructure Foundation, you know, we have found some um, some approaches that that we think are, uh, are are very robust and help to bring maturity into that software development process and um, so when when we are hosting projects within our foundation we make sure that there is CI we make sure that there's code reviews we make sure that um, there are are some kind of standard processes for how how the code flows into the project um, to to uh, kind of introduce that maturity into it and so I think you know the community, and then the way the code gets built is is really a uh, really key for um, you know evaluating which projects you you may or may not want to use. And you know that's not to say there's there are millions and millions of open source projects out there, and it's very easy to to pull in projects that are um, that you know are are maintained by a single developer, and and sometimes those are are great for uh, for specific use cases. Uh, but I'm talking about, you know, when we're thinking of this kind of multi-decade type platform, you you definitely want to put a little more evaluation into it. Yeah, and I think, you know, to that point, you know, one of the things that, that Bruce mentioned was that, you know, let's not just blindly assume that throw open source at everything, it's gonna it's gonna work out great. You know, we need to be thinking to your point about kind of how how the open source is developed if you're gonna be uh, relying on it long term. And I think you know, kind of related to that within the open infra foundation. We have a community called Open Infra Labs. If you go to openinfralabs.org, you can learn more about it. But um, 
know, this is an effort to really run a production cloud, massive production cloud with a bunch of open source components, but um, also to share back the knowledge on telemetry. They have a telemetry working group that actually looks at what does all the software look like in a production environment? Where are the bottlenecks? What configurations work well? So other people can replicate that. Because a lot of times I think, you know, people just grab a bunch of source code and roll it all together. They're not gonna have a great experience, right? So we have obviously a big ecosystem around some of these, these tools, you know, OpenStack obviously has a big ecosystem around it. And now that we see, you know, uh, uh, projects like like Magma, you're starting to see an ecosystem grow around that. And uh, and actually on, on that point, I think Jonathan, you mentioned earlier that this Freedom Fi is one of the startups in the the Magma space, and they they announced uh, that they're doing something cool that involves crypto and 5G and kind of like all the buzzwords. So you know, do you want to say say another uh, moment about the the Freedom Fi announcement? Yeah, I I think that um, this. Probably one of the points that stuck with me from that was what uh, what Bruce and Martine were both saying about how it's a combination of things that you might not put together immediately. You know, you might not think, okay, blockchain and 5G and open source, and you know that's going to create a whole. But each of those um, each of those techno technologies is really shaped around how do we create platforms that you can arbitrarily uh, build on top of for for whatever kind of use case, and so it does make sense that that you know we're going to see a lot of a lot of surprising things happening um, in I think in in that space, and I think the other piece that's uh, that that's exciting too is um, these are these are representing uh, ways where we are taking technology and making it more accessible to to more people for more use cases. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's always excited me about Magma is it expands the possible use cases for this type of technology because it makes it simpler and lower cost to run that kind of network. Um, so, you know, you I you wouldn't necessarily go out and and uh, and and try to run one of one of those uh, top ten networks in the world on Magma today. You know, maybe at some point in the future. But the I think the you know the interesting thing about it is all of the other kinds of networks that it's enabling and all of those those new use cases that that are um, that are going to be developed that we don't really even have any idea what they are and I think the freedom that's part of why the freedom Pi one is um, really caught my attention because it's an example of, of that where that was not a thing that uh, that I was thinking about um, not a thing that I, I had necessarily connected all those dots in my head but that's what's great about platforms is you know you enable everybody to, to innovate on top of them yeah, that, I, that and then Bruce kind of brought that up too. Is it's just like you create these platforms, and when everybody has access to them and can influence them, then they, they end up getting used in ways you just absolutely had no no uh, ability to predict, which is actually the magic of it. And uh, but on that point, I'm, I'm still going to put Amar on the spot and try to make a prediction here. So on on Magma, I know that there's a lot of ongoing development work, and so. What do you think is kind of the future of Magma? Are there any kind of features coming that are in development or exciting things that you see might might come to life in Magma as we look a little bit into the future on, on the development side? Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Mark. So one of the big pushes we're doing uh, this year is to uh, productionize the 5G uh, SA, which is basically the standalone architecture. And one of the cool parts of uh, the way we built Magma is that you know we're taking a lot of what we built for 4G and reusing that for 5G, as in uh, because we built the 4G stack ground up, we had the luxury of uh, looking at 5G and building that once, once again. So the, the process of hardening is not going to be as long as it was for 4G. So uh, folks can expect a release that is 5G SA capable, uh, at least lab ready in July, and then you know more production ready um, uh, by, by September. Uh, the other thing uh, that you know I just want to also plug a little bit is that the there's a lot of exciting stuff happening in the space altogether, right? So, you know, Spectrum is becoming easier. You know, Germany has industrial spectrum. Japan has industrial spectrum. LATAM is now, uh, um, you know, loosening a lot of spectrum. Uh, and so is the US with uh, CBRS. The supply chain, as Martin pointed out, has gotten mature. So just get engaged, right? Like, so, you know, even if you're a user, you're a developer or, or you know, even just an advocate, 
uh, the the equation of like connectivity and connected platforms, be it smart manufacturing or connecting to users, is changing. And so this is a great time to get engaged in this new space because there's a lot of new and interesting things that are happening. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, well, this has been a great chat. Uh, it was awesome earlier to get to talk to, to Bruce and Martine and get back on live with UMR. So I just wanted to, to say one last thing uh, in terms of where everyone can get involved. There are lots of different projects going on and, and at the Open Infra Foundation, you know, we put on Open Infra Live. And so we would encourage everybody out there to join the Open Infra Foundation. It is free for individuals. You can go to openinfra.dev slash join. You know, we really are the, the, commun uh, the foundation. Uh, we are a foundation that's focused on building communities who write software that runs in production, particularly for infrastructure and trying to work on the next decade of open infrastructure. So come do it with us, um, openinfra.dev slash join. And uh, let's work on this stuff together and make the future a little bit better with open source. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank, Thank you, Samar. Thanks, 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 everybody.